Loving Father in heaven, blessed be thy holy name, O Lord. We thank you for giving us the privilege to be among the living. We thank you for protecting us through the night. And we thank you, Lord, for all the basic necessities you give to us to sustain our lives and the food, the shelter, the clothing, the air we breathe. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your holy angels on our behalf, sustaining us, protecting us, and guiding us. Lord in heaven, we pray that as we fellowship with you now, that you shall grant to us of your grace and of your spirit, that we may rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, give us manna from above, that we may be fed. Lord, we hunger and test for righteousness. Please fill us. Put your words in my mouth and help me, Lord, to speak as the oracles of God, that this lesson shall be absorbed into the minds of your children. Grant me of your spirit, Lord, and edify us, strengthen us, and prepare us for the coming of the Lord, that we may not be found wanting. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Conflict and Courage, September 3. For in the furnace. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord did not forget his own. As his witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person, and together they walked in the midst of the fire. In the presence of the Lord, of heat and cold, the flames lost their power to consume. From his royal seat, the king looked on, expecting to see the men who had defied him utterly destroyed. But his feelings of triumph suddenly changed. The nobles standing near saw his face grow pale as he started from the throne and looked intently into the glowing flames. In alarm, the king, turning to his lords, asked, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Lo, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fort is like the Son of God. How did that hidden king know what the Son of God was like? The Hebrew captives, filling positions of trust in Babylon, had in life and character represented before him the truth. When asked for a reason of their faith, they had given it without hesitation. Plainly and simply, they had presented the principles of righteousness, thus teaching those around them of the God whom they worshipped. They had told of Christ, the Redeemer, to come, and in the form of the fort, in the midst of the fire, the king recognized the Son of God. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain in the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as has not been since there was a nation. His chosen ones will stand unmoved. Satan, with all the hosts of evil, cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel in strength will protect them, and in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods, able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in him. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is For in the Furnace. Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 1 and 2 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Do you remember province of Babylon? Remember yesterday where we ended saying Daniel requested of the king to make his brothers Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego the leaders of the province of Babylon. And where did Nebuchadnezzar put this image? 
in the province of Babylon. There were many other provinces, but the province of Babylon is where he put it. And these boys, these men now, were the ones who were in charge of this place. Now, verse 2 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. In this story of Nebuchadnezzar erecting this gigantic and huge image, here we read that this image was three score cubits high. Do you know what that is? We're talking of 60, at least 60 cubits. And a cubit is more than a feet, almost two feet in some cases. So imagine 60 cubits, we are getting close to 120 feet high. That's how tall this image was. So think about that. The regular houses we'll see are not even up to 50 feet high. They're not even up to 30 feet. So when we talk about 120 feet, or just call it 100 feet, and imagine what that looked like. This was a towering image. It was gigantic and it was very imposing. And it was gold from top to bottom. And we will understand what this represents for us today. In this story of Nebuchadnezzar erecting this image, we see type and anti-type. You cannot read this without remembering the book of Revelation, chapter 13. The reading from verse 11, there is going to be a power. Remember that beasts represent power. And this beast, the second beast in Revelation 13, is going to build an image to the first beast an image and will say that everyone should worship that image and that whosoever will not worship the image or receive the mark of the beast would what perish they will be killed that's what the bible says it said whoever will not do that will be killed you see this story here it is just type and anti-type remember that the book first corinthians 10 verse 11 says now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So, everything about this story is going to tell us what is going to happen in these last days. It was written for our learning. It's a type of what is going to happen when the image to the beast is brought up. And remember, the image of the beast doesn't have to be an image like the one Nebuchadnezzar did. It's not even going to be something physical image means a replica of something so the image of the beast is something we will look at subsequently and the mark but for now we just want to learn as god's children what are the lessons we can learn on how we should conduct ourselves when we find ourselves in this same situation that these boys found themselves we will see an example of what our attitude to civil authorities should be so in this case again we see the issue of liberty of conscience being threatened in a greater degree than what we saw in our devotion yesterday. Liberty of conscience here is being threatened. Nebuchadnezzar represents the global hegemony of the West today. A government that is permitted to take away people's rights in the time of an emergency will create an emergency to take people's rights away. Satan is leading the world into a time of emergency and making them think that the only way to deal with the world's issues is by taking away people's civil liberties and their religious liberties. They claim that if the liberties are not taken away and if the people do not comply, then they are enemies to the progress of the world at large. This was how Nebuchadnezzar felt. He felt that in order for his kingdom to be secured and established, everyone needed to show their loyalty to his decrees and anyone who does not comply will face the civil penalties. It seems that there was an attempted coup on his government. There's a historical um, play to this thing. Nebuchadnezzar didn't just erect this image because he loved to erect it. There are some school of thoughts that say that he erected it because this was something that actually happened. His kingdom was almost taken from him and so he wanted to be sure of all his subjects and became very heavy-handed on everyone. Some time ago, he had been told that his kingdom was not going to last forever, Daniel had told him, and someone else was going to take it after him. There was going to be a second one. It was not going to be gold from top to bottom, but gold was only the head. His proud heart had waited in anticipation for this day. He couldn't doubt the dream, but he would not resign himself to fate. Nevertheless, he made this 
daunting image of gold from top to bottom. There was no silver, no brass, no iron, no clay. Perhaps in rebellion to the dream he dreamt when he was only the head of gold. The image was gold from the head to the feet, indicating the eternality of his kingdom and that he, and that he will make every effort to secure it forever. He would use force to ensure that there is no one who will arise to wrest this kingdom from him. But he who is in charge of everything was going to teach this king a lesson about himself that's about God. Daniel 3 verse 3 says, Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You see, among these rulers, like I've stated, is Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They were in Babylon itself, that place where it was set up. It's their own province. Daniel 3, reading from verse 4 now to 7 says, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, and psaltery, and all the kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. What does this remind us of? It tells us in the book of Revelation 13 that all the world wandered after the beast. Here all the people are bowing to this image. But there's going to be a select few who in the Bible are described in Revelation 14 verse 12 as those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of it, Jesus. This matter of bowing is very important. Remember Mordecai? Mordecai also had this issue of bowing to Haman. Now these boys had the issue of bowing to an image, but they were Jews. And Mordecai said, I am a Jew. I don't hate this man, but I'm a Jew. I can't. It's going against my freedom, my religious liberty. I can't bow. And these boys were in the same situation. Daniel, Mishael, Haraniah, and Azariah, although Daniel was exempt, but his three brothers, they came to this feast in obedience to the king. Prior to this time, Israel had never been in such a straight position. They had always been in their own land and dwelt safely. Under slavery in Egypt, they were never compelled to worship the Egyptian gods. When in the days of the apostasy, God permitted the Midianites, Philistines, Ammonites and other nations to oppress them, they were never compelled to worship other gods. In fact, it was their idolatry of worshipping other gods that was the reason for which God allowed those nations to oppress them. As they continued in idolatry, they were given a false representation of who the God of heaven was and if anyone had asked Daniel about his practices and he said he didn't worship idols, it would have been a surprise to the other nations. I mean, the Israelites, as they continued in idolatry, it would have been a surprise to see these boys, Daniel, Mishael, Azariah and all of them saying, we don't worship idols where I come from. Why? Because Israel were worshipping idols, majority of them. So these boys were a stark contrast to what Israel, I mean the majority of them, were doing. The people would have seen Daniel and his brothers as odd because Israel was known for idolatry. Other nations thought that it was no big deal to bow. But these boys were going to show a true representation of God to show them what Jews really are like, what Christians really are like. We are in the same situation today. Sometimes when as a Christian, you tell people, I don't watch movies or I don't listen to all the music and they are looking like, people look, look at you like you're odd. I mean, people of other religions, like, is it not the Christians that are even acting the movies to start with? You look like a sore tomb. You look very odd. Yes, that's what we ought to do. As Israel were idolaters, these three boys were odd and we ought to be odd with respect to what others are doing and show forth the praises of God, even if it means coming against the law of the state. The book of Romans chapter 13 verse 1 to 7 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be, or, that be are ordained of God. 
Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, he must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. This text I just read does not show in any way that we are to bow to any image or to go against the commandments of God. It is saying that we should give civil liberties, we should do our civil liberties as is required by the government. But when the government is making laws that are not in harmony with the will of God, that is going to cause us to deny our faith. The three Hebrew boys gives us an example of how we are to respond to such a thing. In Daniel 3, reading from verse 8, it says, Wherefore at that time the Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Verse 12, it says that they went to report to Nebuchadnezzar, saying to him, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. These boys, of course, the story is that they refused to bow. And Nebuchadnezzar called them and said, Is it true what I'm hearing about you? And they said, Yes. And they, he told them, I'm going to give you a second chance. Next time, when you hear the music, make sure you bow. But the children, these boys, were unapologetically standing for the right. In Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 16, says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Wow! What a daring challenge to Nebuchadnezzar, a daring response to him. This was going to affect his pride. In the presence of his subject, he was being addressed this way. People telling him, we're not going to listen to you. What will he do? If he leaves them alone, he will feel like, oh, people are going to get the message that somebody can challenge me and get away with it. Now, the spirit of these boys is going to enter into all other people in my province and they will see that they can actually challenge me and get away with it. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar was angry. Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 19, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace once seven times, more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their trousers, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Wow. What we learn from this part of the story is that we are not to make any compromise in the presence of rulers and kings. Obedience to the powers that be is true, as we read in the book of Romans 13, but until liberty of conscience is infringed upon. If we must seek for positions of influence in the world, then we must also be ready to face manfully the troubles and responsibilities that come upon those in these positions. These men did not flinch for one moment in the face of the government. They stood their ground unapologetically. They were not deluded also. They didn't do this presumptuously thinking that God will preserve their lives. They knew they could die and they were ready to die. Perhaps the previous troubles they had passed through had so sealed their minds for God that they could expect anything and bear whatever it was that came their way. These men had already passed through the painful process of castration and had been emasculated. Sometimes we need to learn to have the right reaction to pain and unfortunate circumstances. Some Jews today curse their God 
and have completely forsaken him because of the things that he permitted to happen to them. The Holocaust being one of the most recent and extreme examples of this. But not these boys. We need this kind of courage and strength today, one that is not afraid to die. The previous experiences they had had, you remember when we talked about their castration? Do you know what it is? 100 days, that is over 3 months in pain waiting for the wounds to heal. These things had hardened them, it had cooked them to the point that they would look back at the experiences they've had and say, Oh King, look, we have passed through greater troubles than this. If I did not die or I did not forsake God when I was castrated, if I did not forsake God when I went through that days, those days of pain, this fire is not enough to cause me to bow. Kill me instead. Just know that nothing you do is going to make me bow to this image. Why? I have suffered. I have suffered. I have passed through a lot. The Bible tells us that we as Christians should be ready to have this same spirit. In the book of Matthew 10, reading from verse 17, Jesus was telling his disciples, he said to them, he said to them but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father of the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in the city, flee to another. Matthew 10 verse 24 then says, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops, and fear, the, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Amen. This will be more fulfilled in these last days. If we must serve God against the kind of government that is developing in most nations on a, and on a global stage, we must have the same courage of these three boys. We must be unapologetic in standing for the truth. Jesus kept on saying, fear them not, fear not, fear not, speak boldly, do what you are supposed to do. We must be ready to lose our lives. We must follow the instruction of Jesus to not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. These boys in captivity had been through hell, walking on foot and in chains from Israel to a far country in Babylon and then pastoring through that shame and pain of emasculation and castration had certainly taught them lessons of endurance and also they felt that they had nothing to lose. If we feel we have something to lose, that is when we will be afraid of dying. Many more like them, faithful martyrs of the ages, had stood for their faith in the midst of the flames and died. They were not delivered from the fire but they show us an example of what we must be in order to serve God today. I am reminded of the story of a man called Jerome. This man was from Bohemia where we know as Czech Republic today or Czechoslovakia. He was from there, him and a man called John Hoss. John Hoss was his close friend. Because he stood for the truth, he was cancelled by the Pope in his time. And that time there was another man called Emperor Sigismund who had said that he was going to protect Hoss. But when Horse came to give a defense for his faith, he was captured, put in prison, and then he was taken to the stick and killed there, burnt. Jerome, when he knew about it, came before Horse was burnt. And when he came to that place where it was done, he was about he was running away. And while he was running away, they caught him and they brought him also to testify for his faith. Jerome, that time 
did not do what he was supposed to do according to Matthew 10. Jesus said, take no thought what you were going to say. He was taking thought and looking for how he was going to escape. And he, he was trying to be smart. And he said, I renounce everything that horse said that is not in harmony with the word of God. Now they told him to renounce everything that Horse and Wycliffe had taught and that was what he was doing. He said, I renounce everything Horse and Wycliffe had said that is not in harmony with God's will. He was being smart. How can you say you renounce and then you say not in harmony with God's will? Was there anything they said not in harmony with God's will? Nothing like that. So they locked him up in prison again for about a year and they persecuted him so. Why I'm bringing up this story is just that I look at the story of Jerome like what these boys had passed through in the past. So Jerome passed through pain, hell in that prison. And when he came out, he was cooked, ready to answer them now. Just like these boys had passed through hell and they had nothing to lose. Even though they were made uh, leaders of the province of Babylon, they did not attach themselves to those things. If they were attached to it, they would have been apologetic and say, Oh, King, please, I'm very sorry. Um, you know, God we serve is this and that. Can you help us? Or they would have just compromised and felt, Let's just bow. But these boys were not attached to anything in Babylon and they were ready to lose even their lives. They were not attached to their lives. Jerome passed through an experience that made him not to be attached to his life. You see, it is not easy for anyone to come to this position that these boys were in. I mean, the boldness, that's what I mean, not the being in Babylon, but to come to this height where you can answer the king in this manner or like Jerome answered the, the Pope at the time. Let me read Jerome's response. I'm, why I'm going through this is we need some cooking we need to pass through some experiences if we are still attached to the things of this world we need to pass through some experiences that will detach us so that we have nothing to lose and we can give the same response of this man it says at his retraction i'm reading from great controversy page 113 paragraph 1 and i'm going downward it says at his retraction jerome had assented to the justice of the sentence condemning horse he now declared his repentance and bore witness to the innocence and holiness of the martyr and he said i knew him from his childhood he was a most excellent man just and holy he was condemned notwithstanding his innocence i also i am ready to die i will not recoil before the torments that are prepared for me by my enemies and false witnesses who will one day have to render an account of their impostures before the great god whom nothing can deceive in self-reproach for his own denial of truth jerome continued of all the sins that i have committed since my youth none weigh so heavily on my mind and cause me such poignant remorse as that which i committed in this fatal place when i approved of the iniquitous sentence rendered against wycliffe and against the holy martyr john horse my master and my friend yes i confess it from my heart and declare with horror that i disgracefully quailed when through a dread of death i condemned their doctrines i therefore supplicate almighty god to deign to pardon me my sins and this one in particular the most heinous of all Pointing to his judges, he said firmly, You condemned Wycliffe and John Horse, not for having shaken the doctrine of the church, but simply because they branded with reprobation the scandals proceeding from the clergy, their pomp, their pride, and all the vices of the prelates and priests. The things which they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think and declare like them his words were interrupted the prelates trembling with rage cried out what need is there of further proof we behold with our own eyes the most obstinate of heretics unmoved by the tempest jerome exclaimed what do you suppose that i fear to die you have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon more horrible than death itself you have treated me more cruelly than a Turk, Jew or Pagan and my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive and yet I make no complaint for lamentation ill becomes a man of heart and spirit but I cannot but express my astonishment at such great barbarity towards a Christian. Again the storm of rage burst out and Jerome was hurried away to prison Yet there were some in the assembly upon whom his words had made a deep impression and who desired to save his life. He was visited by dignitaries of the church and urged to submit himself to the council. 
the most brilliant prospects were presented before him as the reward of renouncing his opposition to Rome. But like his master, when offered the glory of the world, Jerome remained steadfast. Prove to me from the holy writings that I am in error, he said, and I will abjure it. The holy writings, exclaimed one of his tempters, is everything then to be judged by them? Who can understand them till the church has interpreted them? Are the traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Savior? replied Jerome. Paul did not exhort those to whom he wrote to listen to the traditions of men, but said, Search the scriptures. Heretic was the response. I repent having pleaded so long with you. I see that you are urged on by the devil. Ere long, sentence of condemnation was passed upon him. He was led out upon the same spot which horse had yielded up his life. He went singing on his way, his countenance lighted up with joy and peace. His gaze was fixed upon Christ, and to him death had lost its terrors. When the executioner, about to kindle the pile, stepped behind him, the martyr exclaimed, Come forward boldly, apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not be here. His last words, uttered as the flames rose about him, were a prayer. Lord Almighty, Almighty Father, he cried, have pity on me and pardon me my sins, for thou knowest that I have always loved thy truth. His voice ceased, but his lips continued to move in prayer. When the fire had done its work, the ashes of the martyr, with the earth upon which they rested, were gathered up, and like those of horse, were thrown into the Rhine. So perished God's faithful light bearers, but the light of the truths which they proclaimed, the light of their heroic example, could not be extinguished, as well might men attempt to turn back the sun in its course as to prevent the dawning of the day when was which was even then breaking upon the world end of quote amen what can we see from this account of the story of jerome we have things easy today but yet we still deny christ at the cost of their lives these boys and even jerome and horse and wycliffe they did not seek for a second chance their words to nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3 verse 16 to 18 says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. These boys were thrown into the fire. The reformers were put in the fire and in the flames also for their faith. Jerome's words during this conversation had a lesson for us. He said, You have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon, more horrible than death itself. Unless sin has become a frightful dungeon that seems more horrible than death to us, we will keep on holding to our sins to protect our lives because this life still means something to us. Only those who prefer to die than to sin will be able to bear the threat of the state to their lives. Jerome had seen that frightful dungeon as worse than death. And unless we see sin as a frightful dungeon worse than death, we will always compromise. Before, Jerome was afraid, but he passed through an experience that took away the fear of death from him. What was it that took, him, took away the fear of death? That experience in the dungeon. The three Hebrew boys had also passed through an experience that had made them to loathe and hate sin, so that when they were being compelled to sin at the expense of their lives, they said, no, we are not going to sin. We know something that is worse than what you want to do to us right now, and that is disobedience to God's commandments. Do you view it in this manner? We are coming to a time in Revelation 13 when we read from verse 11 to 17, I've taken that passage so many times, that tells us that in verse 15, that this other beast had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is where we are coming to. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
What can we expect from a world that is becoming increasingly intolerant of others, of other people's views and opinions? The state is getting involved in religion and making laws that trample on the religious rights of others. It is only a matter of time before we get to a similar state of things as that which these boys found themselves in. As Nebuchadnezzar set up an image to be worshipped, so also the world is coming to this position where, under one pretext or another, the religious rights of people are going to be infringed upon. Under this threat, we must possess the same courage of these boys. But the truth is, what I've been trying to put in our minds is this. If you have not passed through an experience and you face this same situation, you will compromise. They had passed through an experience that made them see life in a different form. What Jerome also passed through made him start to see life differently. So that when they came to the University of Babylon, they were not going to make a compromise even in the smallest of matters. If you want to kill me, kill me. I have passed through something worse than death. Do you know what that thing is? Sin. If we are not seeing sin for what it is, if we don't hate sin, if we don't come to a position where we, where we have been under the slavery of sin and we have been beaten and battered and wounded by sin, we will not want to turn away from it. We need to pass through that. You know the Israelites, first of all, when God called them out of Egypt, they were tormented in Egypt. Egypt represents sin. If sin has not tormented you, you will want to compromise. We need to have a mindset like these boys. We need to, even if we don't pass through an experience, at least know in your mind, this is what I should have. I should hate sin to the point where even the smallest of sins, I will not compromise to preserve my life. I will not compromise to preserve my job. I will not compromise to preserve my marriage. I will not compromise to preserve my friendship, to preserve my possessions. We must be ready to lose all things for Christ's sake. And Jesus promised to us is those who lose their life will find it and those who preserve their life will lose it. But I am going to the root of the matter. You can't just say, oh, I know I'm supposed to lose my life. You need to have an experience, something that will make you realize that, look, there's nothing in this life. What is there for me to preserve? If it were you, like these three Hebrew boys who had passed through the pain of castration, the, 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 the humiliation, and also that trekking from Israel down to Babylon, it, it should make you think to yourself, what is there again in this life? I have lost everything. What am I preserving? To them, Babylon and its treasures meant nothing to them. And they had said to them, they said to Nebuchadnezzar, kill me if you want. I'm not going to bow. We need to come to this position and view things in the right light like these boys did. They viewed it in the right light that it was better for them to be thrown into that fire. But what happened? The Lord preserved them. Jerome was not preserved. Many martyrs of the past were thrown into the fire and they burnt the only people whom we have heard of like this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then we know of John the Beloved who was thrown into hot boiling oil. He did not die. But the other apostles, they all died. They were beheaded. They were crucified upside down. They were dragged with horses on the streets while they were tied to the horses and they died. All those things happened to them. And this was what these boys were expecting. God could deliver us or he will not. Whichever the case, we are not going to bow. That is the mindset we need to have. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked into that fire, what did he see? There was someone with them in that fire. Why was it so? Because they had reflected the image of Christ to Nebuchadnezzar. How was he able to recognize that son of man? Because they had shown for the praises of Christ. These boys, including Daniel, had represented Christ to him so that Nebuchadnezzar was able to see and understand and say, I see the son of man there. Reading from Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page one. 169 paragraph 3 says through the hebrew captives the lord was made known to the hidden in babylon this idolatrous nation was given a knowledge of the kingdom the lord was to establish and through his power maintain against all the power and craft of satan daniel and his fellow companions Ezra and Nehemiah and many others were witnesses for God in their captivity. The Lord scattered them among the kingdoms of the earth that their light might shine brightly amid the black darkness of hedonism and idolatry. 
To Daniel, God revealed the light of his purposes, which had been hidden for many generations. He chose that Daniel should see in vision the light of his truth and reflect the light upon the proud king of Babylon. On the despot king was permitted to flash light from the throne of God. Nebuchadnezzar was shown that the God of heaven was ruler over all the monarchs and kings of earth. His name was to go forth as the God of all gods. God desired Nebuchadnezzar to understand that the rulers of earthly kingdoms had a ruler in the heavens. God's faithfulness in rescuing the three captives from the flames and vindicating their course of action showed his wonderful power. Amen. Those who will overcome today are described in Revelation 14 verse 12 as the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Faith is the only way by which we can overcome. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And it was this faith that Jerome had and these three Hebrew boys had that took them through the fire, while the one was delivered and the other was burnt to ashes, but all will be saved at last. We should have this faith. Ephesians 6, verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy the fire of satan the fire of nebuchadnezzar though not quenched but was powerless against these boys why the shield of faith we must take the shield of faith and be ready to die for christ's sake and not to compromise when we are required to may the lord help us not to be attached to our own lives or to anything so that we can properly represent him let us pray Dear Father in heaven, we see the need to be prepared for what is coming ahead of us. We deny you today even when we have not been threatened to be thrown into the fire. We deny you today even when no one has laid a finger on us, not even a word has been spoken against us of our own will because we love the world. We deny you. We compromise. Then what will happen when we are threatened? Oh Lord, we are not prepared. Forgive us for all the times we have compromised even when we've not been threatened. Forgive us for all the times that we have compromised for our own selfish gain. Help us, Lord, not to be attached to any possession or anything of this life so that nothing shall separate us from the love of God revealed through Christ Jesus our Lord. Cook us, O Lord, and bring us to a position where, like these boys, we can be able to boldly say we are not careful to answer anyone. We will not bow. We know that we are not there yet. Oh Lord, please bring us to such a position for without it, we will continue to deny you on this earth. Thank you Lord for I know you will help us and you will give us the grace to have such courage and boldness. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee
Shall the flame.